Um, we're going to convene, um, of course, before we do, uh, Maureen Carney is actually coming. She was originally excused, but she's probably, she's just texted me and said she'll probably be So, Laura, would you please call the roll? Sure. Councilor Dwight. Here. Councilor Carney. Councilor here. Councilor here. Here. All right. We have a quorum. So this is the meeting of September 24th of Legislative Matters. And we're, we're all in our places with bright, shiny faces. Um, right now, if anyone wants to speak, uh, uh, we're opening this up for public comment. Fred, do you want to have a? Yeah, maybe I should speak. My name is Fred Zimnock, Ward 3. And uh, I'm interested in the uh, change in the cemetery ordinance, which would be chapter uh, 153. And previously, uh, in the old ordinance, uh, the city was allowed to take 6% from the trust fund. And generally, at least in my mind, trust funds should be conservatively managed. We probably need the bond fund. Uh, in that case, if you look at, for example, a 10-year bond for the last 10 years, it's been, I think it touched 3% at one time, and then it's been below 3% until just recently, I think it popped up over 3%. Over 3%. So the change in the ordinance, namely to reduce the 6% to 3%, makes sense to me. Um, I think uh, preserving the trust fund for the cemetery is important because the cemetery has a lot of historical value uh, uh, that's, that's really great for the city. The other thing that I see in the legislature ordinance is that uh, they're changing the assessment of a trust fund with, with a 20-point uh, a rolling average. And basically what that will do is it'll chop off the peaks in case the fund goes very high. You won't be taking out a lot of money. On the other hand, uh, it sort of raises up the values so the treasurer or city collector or whoever is in charge might have to use a little discretion if the fund goes down a little bit. But basically I think it's a great idea. Um, the only part that really concerns me is that the way this is written is it says that uh, it replaces chapter 53 and basically, basically chapter 53 has a lot of sections to it. It has sections four through 16. So the question I have is, what happens to sections four through 16, which I think are important? And uh, one final question I have that you probably can't answer, and that is, how do we see an annual report of the trust fund, and what's the value of the Clark Trust Fund? Thank you. And, Thank you. and in fact, actually, when that item comes up, you're actually free to yeah. reiterate, reiterate your questions, but they've already been heard, so we can probably address those. So if anyone else wants to speak to public comment at this point. Now, with this, uh, with legislative matters, um, precedent's been established, actually, by Councilor Murphy and his administration. And uh, so we will allow comment during the, as the items come up. So if you want to speak to items specific, we can do that and it'll probably make it easier for you. Or if, if you just want to speak generically right now, you're welcome. Uh, you are, my, my name is Hank Abraskin. Uh, I do have the parking on a dare place item here. Shall I wait until that? Yeah, yeah, okay. and yes. Okay. Yeah, that would, that would probably be better for you. Okay. That's great. Um, so we'll, we'll move right into the agenda. And, and um, there has been a request to move the cemeteries up. That doesn't sound right. Um, <laughs> to, on the agenda, in any event, um, to to address some of the questions that Mr. Zimnock has and that maybe the counselors have, and move on that item first. So, are there any objections to that? Okay. So this this I'm sorry. Move that we also move the Adair place up. I think that. Sure. <laughs> well, yeah. Okay. For actually, <laughs> I should note that. Um, Item 18.123 and item, uh, item 18.125 are not going to be addressed uh, today because they're actually still in committee, TPC. So that we're automatically sort of dropping down to uh, the next ones. But so what we'll do is we'll, given the fact that judging by 
the look of the audience. We're gonna revert we're gonna reverse this a little bit. We'll talk about cemeteries, we'll talk about Dare Place, and then we'll uh, talk about the order to strengthen democratic representation of the housing authority. And those first three items. So is that okay? And that just sort of leaves Councillor Nash here hanging for <laughs> till the end. So first up, this is um, this is an ordinance to amend Chapter 153 in cemeteries. Uh, and th that's what you heard Mr. Zimnock referring to. Um, and actually, why not, actually, and we have a solicitor here, so actually, if um, you wouldn't object, would you want to you break this down, at least address some of it, can you or capable? I get to object. You get to object? <laughs> you um, you so, get to opine. Do we so, have to put it on the floor? Yes, we'll need a motion to put it on the floor. Um, a second? Sure. Okay. All this, okay, go ahead. Um, so, uh, I, I believe that Mr. Zimnock brought up uh, the issue of the <coughs> former um, ordinances and the 6% number, and it causes us to look at this uh, cemetery ordinance more closely. Um, much of what Mr. Zimnock uh, was referring to in terms of the other sections that have been eliminated are all now dealt with by the cemetery division of the Department of Public Works. That's an executive function on the running day-to-day -day of the cemeteries. And so if you go on the uh, DPW's website, the cemetery di division, you'll find all of their regulations that cover all of these, these uh, relevant sections that are now being eliminated. So that, that's my response to the question about what about those other sections right. that have important stuff in them. There are now uh, regulations of the DPW Cemetery Division. Other questions, discussion on this one? Nothing. Okay. Fred, are you uh, comfortable with that response? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, all right, so the motion, oh, Councilor Nash. I just want to say this is a great this is a great example of the city listening to its citizens. You know, Fred met with the mayor. He noticed this this inconsistency and brought it up and it prompted the mayor and the city solicitor to take a look at it and here we go. We're 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 changing something. And um, good work by Fred and uh, and nice response by the city. All right, Fred, look for the headlines. Um, <laughs> uh, any other discussion on this? Uh, all those uh, in favor of sending this forward with an, a positive recommendation to the council, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. All right. Uh, next, a dear place. Let me see that item. That's item 18.138. I'm sorry, Laura, we're jumping all over the place here for you. But, um, this is an ordinance relevant to the parking on Adair Place, and this is referred to us on July 12th. Um, and I'll accept the motion to put it on the floor. I'll move that. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Hello? Hello, hello. Uh, well, I appreciate you addressing this. Um, Adair Place, if you are people familiar with Adair Place? Yeah, there you are. It's, um, it's a lovely street, but it's a narrow street that goes down from Prospect Street near the YMCA and ends with the bike path. Uh, and uh, it, it's, as I said, it's narrow and it's um, parking is, is a little tough. So uh, I think I can give you the background of what happened in about 60 to 90 seconds. Um, <clears throat> the, the residents of the street are, of course, like everywhere, concerned about parking. Uh, got in touch with Rich Parasoli uh, because even though on the side of the street near town, which would be on uh, the um, eastern eastern side, uh, there is a pretty good no parking zone. Uh, it's not wasn't that clearly marked, and uh, cars parked there a lot. So uh, we got in touch with him and asked him if he could add to the signage, and uh, he very kindly came down, and he did. In the process, he observed that on the other side of the street, on the west side, uh, on the right as one is going out of the dare place, uh, the no parking zone sign didn't have a supporting ordinance. So he removed it. 
And that's when I learned that every sign in the city has to have a supporting ordinance. So um, we're uh, here, I'm, I'm kind of a spokesperson for the people who live there, uh, just trying to go back to go and get that sign replaced so the no parking was the way it always has been for the 15 years that I've lived there, probably a long time before. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Nash, do you want to move at all? I think Mr. Abrashkin has pretty much summarized everything. Uh, the, um, the idea here is that, yeah, the city went out to address signage concerns and found that there was inconsistencies with what was on the ground and what was in city ordinance and began applying what was on the books and that prompted this process. Um, TPC reviewed it and felt that the original conditions were just fine and so that's where basically had what you have before you is to bring us back to what the people on the street thought was there in the first place any questions <laughs> well just to <clears throat> comment this isn't that we're coming up against this and a few other we've dealt with this with hooker avenue you know where there are signs that don't um, jive with what's on the books. So, right. and sometimes it's not found out until something else like, like this happens. So I'm glad we're able to kind of nip this in the bud, uh, at least with a positive recommendation from TBC. Yes. I'm, I'm afraid actually this is gonna come up. It's gonna keep happening. So <laughs> there, was, there was a essentially back in the day someone would request something of the council or council would say by shit by will be done they would tell the dpw and they just go plant signs like uh can we like go the back flowers there? but you know <laughs> we're not going back to that. but in the but uh, in situations like this usually they're not investigating all of them but when there's an actual request or something then uh people like rich parcelletti will research it and realize okay this is a spot we've got to clear up in fact actually we're addressing this over and over again as Councilor Carney pointed out. But so there's no um, any further conversation on this discussion. Uh, all those in favor of forwarding this to the council to uh, an affirmative approval, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any okay. Thank you very much. And, and uh, if I could just get some clarification on where the process goes from here. Um, it'll go to the council. They'll have to go to the, uh, it'll be on the agenda for the council and then we vote on that. And we're just, basically as a committee, we have just, we have uh, made, we have recommended it. So as transportation and parking, I like its chances in the council, but I can't guarantee anything, so. Uh, and any indication when that's gonna be before the council? I, October 4th. October 4th, the next meeting. Oh boy. Was that? In two readings. Uh, It'll be twice, well, so the 4th and then again the 18th. Well, October 4th, I'm scheduled to be out of the country, unfortunately. You are? Well, uh, so it is necessary for somebody to be there? Not necessary. And in fact, actually, Hank, if you rather, you can write a letter. And you can send a letter to, uh, you send care of Laura here, at, at the administrative assistant on the city council. She'll share That's it with all of us. And we'll have that on, <clears throat> on record, as you can see. This is not one of the burning controversies, so I don't expect a lot of trouble. So, but it's perfectly acceptable for the public record for you to submit a letter. Great. Well, that'd be great. Another option would be to move the consideration of it to Puerto Rico, where I'm going to be. If you if you like well, to, um, we'll to be in that city and go, but sounds an awful lot like we're ready. And then we'll do it. We have to let them travel budget. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> our, our travel budget will get us a chicken. So, so we'll, meet you, we'll meet you halfway. I'd just like to thank everybody very much, and I'll send a letter, and I appreciate it. Thanks. Very good. Thank you very much. Okay. So. Thanks a lot, Jim. Can you talk to you soon. Uh, next up, this is um, item 18.142, um, and this is uh, in order to strengthen the democratic representation in the Northampton Housing Authority. And I um, understand there's been some, some ongoing discussion, but uh, first I'll accept a motion and put this on the floor. Okay. And a 
second. It's second. Okay. Okay. We got it. It's on the floor. The uh, sponsor of this ordinance is here, and uh, I I would uh, invite Ryan to come up and speak to this. If you would. Yeah, absolutely. I'd like to go on record by telling the committee before I park anywhere, I read the entire code of ordinance. <laughs> I'm sure that's Make sure I'm comporting with the law. It's, it's, hard, it's hard to give up the transportation and parking. It's in your blood. It's, it's chronic. Um, should I just give kind of a brief introduction? Please. Yeah. Um, I think, as you know, uh, part of the genesis of this was one incident this summer. But I'd like to sort of convince you by the end of my remarks that this is a proposal which is not about one incident, it's about structural reform. Uh, it's not about the current Housing Authority board members, it's about the future. And I'd like to ask that we maybe consider it in the same way we consider our charter changes, which is divorced from the actual people doing the jobs at the time, and think about what's best structurally for the institution. Um, the incident, of course, was the removal of um, air conditioning units from uh, at least one building in the middle of a heat wave. Uh, this was a policy decision that um, I don't believe was approved by the Housing Authority Board. Um, that's my understanding from my it conversations. Was. Okay. And um, the reason that concerns me is I think a healthy Housing Authority Board exercises some oversight of the policies that are made by the Housing Authority management. So the question I would have is, why was there not a culture of needing to consult with the Housing Authority board members? Um, but as I say, it's not just about that. So I'd, I'd like to kind of run down what I think those responsibilities are of Housing Authority board members and kind of discuss the structure of it. And I apologize to the council from Ward 7 because they gave the same boring presentation one week ago on a different committee, but I think the details are important. And we often overlook them because housing authorities are sort of off on their own, they're sort of legal islands. Um, as you know, we don't exercise any direct control over them at all. So it's Master General Law Chapter 121B that establishes all the housing authorities in Massachusetts, of which there are over 250. Uh, according to that chapter, they are, quote, managed, controlled, and governed, end quote, by a five-person board. Uh, the training manual for local housing authority board members, 2014 edition, uh, states that the responsibilities of local boards include, uh, but are not limited to, some of these following things. Setting and revising policy, establishing annual operating and capital budgets, ensuring integrity and professionalism, ensuring compliance with federal, state, and local laws, guidelines, rules, uh, overseeing all aspects of employment of the executive director, maintaining good community relations, encouraging and supporting tenant participation in the administration of public housing, and advocating for low-income housing in the interests of the residents. So they're fairly broad um, responsibilities, but I think pretty clearly defined also. Um, the structure of the boards, the same uh, chapter of law, section five, lays out the structure. They vary based on whether the housing authority is in a city or a town, or whether they are regional and involve multiple communities. Uh, in a city like Northampton, the governor appoints one member, and the mayor appoints four with council approval. Recall we just did that at our last meeting. Um, that law provides that of the four, one must be an organized labor representative, one must be a tenant, and the other two are just citizens. In a town, it's different. The non-gubernatorial members are elected by the voters of the town. Um, interestingly, as I researched this, I found out in 2014, the legislature passed uh, a, a law called an act relevant to housing authorities. This was chapter 235 of the acts of 2014. And that reform changed the number of non-gubernatorial appointed um, or elected commissioners in town from four to three. And it made the fourth one that would be elected by the tenants of the, the housing authority. Uh, it also said, of course, that uh, regulations were needed to specify how you would conduct those elections, and it asked that DHCD promulgate those 
Um, to my knowledge, um, I'm not aware that they've actually been finalized, those rules about how to hold 10 elections, which is kind of a, a failure since it's been a long time since 2014. <coughs> uh, the law also directed DHC to, in, to implement a comprehensive training program for the members of housing authorities, including technical assistance training for tenant members, uh, and educating housing authorities on topics including the open meeting law and state ethics law. So it sort of contemplated how this would go if in fact you had a tenant member in town that w was elected by the tenants. So of course you need to make sure they're trained, knowledgeable about the law, um, and of course you need a, a way to actually do this. And finally, a pre-existing section, which you should know about as we contemplate the structure of this, of section six, uh, provides for a mechanism for removal. Again, this had been there before. Uh, you can remove any board member in a city by joint mayor, city council action, uh, including inefficiency, neglect of duty, and misconduct, those kinds of things. Um, there's no perfect structure, in my opinion, that I put one put forward one proposal for your consideration, some discussion of other jurisdictions in the region, and then one federal piece of information to give you, and then I'll, I'll conclude. Uh, New York State Housing Authority boards range from three to seven members. In certain size cities, two members must be tenant commissioners elected by tenants. Um, it's New York Public Housing Law, PGB Section 30. Connecticut municipalities with five boards must include one tenant. If there are seven, excuse me, five member boards must include one tenant. If you have seven members on a board, you need two. And those are similarly elected by the tenants and or tenant organizations. And the federal information to give you is um, current federal regulations expressly affirm just the general importance of tenant participation in housing authorities. Uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, this is Regulation 24 CFR Section 964.11, states, quote, HUD promotes resident participation and the active involvement of citizens in all aspects of housing authorities' overall mission and operation. So that is kind of a, a goal or philosophy that's spelled out in black and white. So just a couple points just to conclude. I think what I'm proposing is pretty straightforward. It's, it's changing the housing authority to add new members. It doesn't change the housing authority any other way. It doesn't change the housing authority board or management. Um, I would say it's minimally disruptive to the overall system. Um, there are other jurisdictions in our region that have larger boards and have more elected tenant part, um, members. And the basic point, which is not about any specific issue, but is a general point, I think that the policy making, the oversight, the community outreach, um, and the tenant participation responsibilities of our housing authority would all be improved very clearly um, if we had more tenants serving on the board. And that's due to personal experiences of tenants uh, and the natural interests and the well-being of their own community. I want to urge you to think about how the housing authority is less an agency or board um, and it's partially a community. So, just some information to kind of ground you. And uh, I'll tell you that the uh, Committee on Community Resources heard this. I actually felt, I won't speak for the committee, but I felt that um, maybe, they're, maybe they were a little bit swayed. I felt like there were many questions in the beginning and, and towards the end, the committee was talking about planning a couple public forums. Um, the way I look, about, look at this is I think this has to be a community conversation um, where tenants and the city council and the mayor and others discuss what's best in a reform to put forward. So that would be my hope. Um, and of course, this committee is a key part of that process also. Um, any other questions? Actually, <coughs> I'd be grateful to hear. I, I've gotten a lot of several reports about uh, the, the discussion in community resources. and someone some outside? Before we do that, just because I have a uh, just a clarification question. Sure. So, as I understand, legislative it was continued in community resources, right? It's still in the community. It's still continued. Yeah. So, am I correct in assuming that we this committee won't take any action until it comes out of committee? Well, we could. Um, it's probably not the 
I, I mean, I think it, I thought it was it, written in our rules that. Well, it could possibly be amended in, in uh, community resources, in which case. Yeah. So. Um, kind of like we when we were waiting on the TPC's recommendation right. for the yeah. other ones that we're waiting for the community resources. Yeah, my feeling is we should continue it till we get an answer from community. community well, just in terms resources. of keeping with our past practice yeah. of being the last committee to. Um, yeah, because if they make a recommendation, we want to. I mean, I, I'm not saying that we shouldn't hear hear from, for example. I mean, I still have to right, think, hear from, but I'm just curious as to whether we actually the, act or make recommendations to the full council at this point, but rather we wait until the other committees to whom it's been referred. I have a letter from Councilor Bidwell, where he outlines. Um, uh, something about uh, um, nominated uh, State Senator Joe Comerford would be um, considering putting forward something similar to this would be statewide and he has said that I asked Councilor Donald if he would consider withdrawing his order in his current form to allow for conversation with colleagues about modifications. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, with, as I've said many times, um, withdrawing an order is actually uh, the opposite of being conducive to discussion. Right. Yeah. I, I don't disagree with that. Absolutely. But yes, the, so the answer to that was pending, apparently. I now have a clear, definitive yes. answer. Well, we also, um, Councilor O'Donnell touched on this, we're, we're planning in community resources to community meetings. Um, with very direct outreach to the seven different communities that are part of the Housing Authority. And that will be kind of, those will present um, opportunities for people, including uh, nominated officials like Joe Comfort and Lindsay Sabadosa and so forth, to, um, to come and to hear from the actual communities. So, I don't think that there's any reason to consider withdrawal of something like this at this point when we have already kind of um, imagined the mechanisms by which we're going to get community input. These proposed four, are they um, tenant specific? Given the fact no, they're going to be open to the community, but we're going to do very targeted outreach to people who live in the communities about which we're going to be speaking. Um, but I do think that, especially since we have the solicitor here, um, and he's very, very happy to be here, as he said when he got here, we could um, generate some of, some of the questions that came up in community resources, and Councilor Nash is here, and Councilor O'Donnell can all kind of, you know, talk about what, what we wanted to hear from the solicitor, and that can be information for us at this stage, but really I think we have a much longer process ahead of us. Okay, well, let's, let's take advantage of the time that we have. We will not act on this one, but it is, it is ten, it's on the floor, and the motion is to continue. Um, right, well, I, are you correct that you wanted to continue it in this? Oh, well, uh, ultimately, I was going to move that we continue until the other committee is done with their work. I know it, it's perfectly prudent to leave it a, a, a live order so we can discuss it, and if more comes or our parent, heir apparent to the state senate shows up and wants to come to your meeting and make recommendations, that's fine. I would like, though, to ask Councilor Sewell some questions. About no, no, that's what I'm saying. I, I, yeah. I would like to take But I would ultimately move yeah. to continue it until right. we hear until the other committee's done. Can Council. I also point out that, not to put them on the spot, but I, I believe there are um, some residents here who you might benefit from hearing from, but whatever order the right. committee Okay. Is. Well, good. So let's let's keep currently this item open for purposes of, the, of discussion. Mm -hmm. um, Councilor Seawall. Well, I, uh, I, underst I understand um, from the draft minutes of community resources that uh, Council Bidwell and Council Nash particularly had some questions about conflicts of interests and um, about the legislative process, how this actually happens uh, mechanically. Um, so let me start there first because um, as, uh, <coughs> as, as President O'Donnell said, um, the, the legislature has very specifically 
told every uh, housing authority how it's going to be organized. And that's like the, the hallmark of occupying the field at the state level. That means we have no room to legislate locally because the, uh, the legislature has taken it over and told us exactly what we're going to do. Um, <clears throat> the, if if uh, the city council were to um, pass this order and the, and the mayor were to carry it forward um, and um, ask our representatives to take it to Boston and the legislature looked positively upon it, they certainly could do what, what uh, what's being proposed by President Obama. I mean, this is within the legislative authority of, of the state legislature. They created this five member board and they can, if properly asked by the city, um, they can uh, pass a special act. Now, <coughs> I hesitate only because um, it, it this is a little odd because we are proposing to pass a special act about a different political body. And so uh, this is not the city, uh, this is not a city body. This is a quasi, uh, what would they call it? Uh, it's a statutory body. And by statute, um, the, only, the only function the city has is for the mayor to make appointments to the to the board. Other than that, it's to totally out of the city's control. So I don't know how the legislature would look at a request for special legislation about uh, an entity that is not the city. Uh, that's the first issue. Um, if the legislature saw fit to do it, I believe it could. Um, <clears throat> Conflict of interests are a little bit more complicated. Alan, on that point, though, um, so this is not a home rule petition per se. It is a home rule petition. It is. Yes, because a home rule petition being defined as uh, being requested to pass a law that applies only to one jurisdiction, to one city or town. The legislature has complete authority to make laws that apply to two or more cities and towns. In the Commonwealth. When it comes to one, uh, the legislature can't act unless that community has asked them to act, and that's a home rule petition. But in this case, it's a home rule petition to not make changes in and of our municipal government, but essentially to impose a change on a legislatively created entity that's separate from the city. That's right. But it has the same name, Northampton. <laughs> and, you know, it has a little overlap because we you know, the majority of the uh, of the members are appointed by the mayor with the uh, approval of, of the council. So it, I mean, I, and as I've, I've said to Ryan that this is this you know this is a little bit different, and I don't have all the answers. I know what the questions are, but I don't really have answers to these questions. Um, but um, you know, if the if the legislature wanted to see the Northampton Housing Authority increase membership increased, I, I believe it could get it done. And you were about to speak on the conflict of interest. What's, what's, the, what's the conflict of interest, Spencer? Well, if once you appoint tenants to a board that is making decisions that have economic impact on the tenants, uh, that is an inherent conflict of interest because, you know, uh, a, a public official, a municipal employee, which housing authority members are, uh, cannot participate in a particular matter in which he, family members, employers have a financial interest. So the, by necessity, the Housing Authority Board does make uh, decisions that have financial impacts on tenants. And so uh, I did speak with a lawyer at the State Ethics Commission. Now, if these are deemed to be appointed employees, then, uh, then the appointing authority can issue a waiver. So any time that the housing authority is going to discuss anything that foreseeably will have a financial impact on the tenants of the housing authority, the tenant members of the board would need to seek exemptions or waivers from their appointing authority in order to avoid the conflict of self-dealing. But as Council Rodon points out, this is not without precedent. There are uh, tenant-occupied boards. There are, I mean, the Housing Authority is a board that has a tenant on it by, by statute, and this would apply to that tenant as well. Right. But now we are, now we are essentially putting a super majority of tenants in charge, so it's a little bit different. It's not one tenant who has to recuse, 
Uh, and you know, and I think that uh, President O'Donnell will tell you that it is theoretically possible that the, the governor, I think the governor has done that right now, has appointed a tenant. Um, and so there's two tenant members on the, on the board right now. Um, and I guess it's theoretically possible that all of the, the members could be tenants. Right. Um, could be. But this is mandating it, and so it's a, you know so it, it it draws the eye to that issue very very uh, quickly. And um, so uh, let me just finish that thought. Um, uh, the proposed order is, I believe, for uh, these six members to be elected by the tenants. I don't know how the ethics commission is going to look at this because if they look at it <coughs> as um, as as an elected position, then there is no exemption because there's no appointing authority. <coughs> if they look at it as an appointment, I'm not <coughs> sure how they'll do that because the appointment is made by the tenants. So it's, I don't have answers to those questions, but um, I'm not saying that this couldn't be done. I mean, it, it will create some other issues. The alternative, of course, is to have a companion piece of special legislation to very specifically deal with this in a way that you, know, you as a legislative body wishes to have it dealt with, um, you know, that's another possibility. Councilman <coughs> Just to underscore that, as the solicitor says, I mean, the conflict of interest issue is a problem for current law. I mean, we really just need one additional member of the housing authority out of five to be a tenant, and suddenly you, you would have a perpetual issue to, be, to think about. Um, I can only guess, I don't have the information, that when the legislature acted, I mean, the legislature took action on this to change uh, the rules for towns and have one of the ten, one of the members be tenant elected. Um, I can only believe that the Department of Housing and Community Development contemplated this or are still contemplating this because towns will have regular tenant elected, elected tenants who are not appointed. So that's something in the process. Maybe we can, that could be a guide for us. But they're elected town wide, though, right? It's not just the tenants of the housing authority. So I believe the law changed it to be a, an election by the residents of the housing authority. Just mm -hmm. one of them, right? Correct. And the right. other three counselors, as you say, are elected by the town. Oh, okay. um, just a question. So, in the instance of our current status, the mayor appointed a tenant representative whose appointing authority is the mayor. Mm -hmm. The other one, though, was appointed by the governor. Correct. So the one who was appointed by a mayor could seek the exemption to vote on things from the mayor. From the, mayor. the other poor soul would have to get the governor's attention right. to get, mm -hmm. yeah, which is. And that's the, that's the status as we sit here today. Okay. But I mean, I don't represent the housing authority, no. so I have no involvement in this at all. And so. Um, you know that that's the current situation that two of the members of so the housing authority forty percent of the current thinking, board are tenants. Yeah. Correct. Need to be thinking carefully about their fi their own financial interests when that comes up as as board members. Mm -hmm. that, that's definitely true. But as you point out, there is an appointing authority for those two to to get ex you know, exactly. their waivers from. Um, and in the situation of a town that President O'Donnell um, raised, that would only that would only be one member who would be excluded because there's no exemption for an elected member or a member who has no appointing authority. So in the town situation, that would only be one member because any other tenant member would have an appointing authority. So once you have a majority, like, like this proposal, you would have a majority of the board with no appointing authority, with no exemption no appointing authority to give an exemption, it's, it's complicated. Then the rule of necessity might kick in. That's, that's what I was going to ask. Um, we're, we're, <laughs> we're all in uncharted territory mm -hmm. here, so uh, I'm just telling you what, what the issues are. And um, I mean, academically, as you point out, the problem already exists. The, the potential for conflict already exists without, without any advice from the legislature, it seems. Um, and um, but we've been here before with uh, issues of conflict and open meeting law and discussions with the ethics board where they have really not comfortable giving clear answers relative to the questions that we have. So, 
Um, that that becomes an issue, provided this actually passes. Right. So, but in, in the abstract, right now, just discussing it. But the. Um, I, I just want to say we're not going to get clear answers to this conflict, these conflict issues. I don't think until this passes, and then right. there is a situation where uh, a member is looking at. Right. At a potential conflict and contacts the state ethics commission right. and finds there, out. Yeah, exactly. They want to offer this advice for something it's, that's theoretical. It's too point. abstract at this yeah. point. Mm -hmm. Councilor Nash. Yeah, but it seems that that conflict is already present. That um, because the we have tenant members already, mm -hmm. and we haven't quite figured this out. And I think it's something we need to talk about and figure out because they're already in the position of making deciding votes on, you know, things that might benefit them. I have no role in figuring that out because I don't represent the housing authority. I don't represent any of them. No, I'm just saying that it's already on the table. It's it's already in existence, whether it's, uh, you know, in, in a minority the way it's now constructed or in a uh, majority under the proposed um, order here. Right, so, but, I, but I, I, the, the point is in order to make the appeal to um, the state ethics board to have them render an opinion. Actually, it would have to come from the housing authority, right? Coming from us because we have no agency over them. That ours is merely theoretical on a, pen on a pending law that we're <laughs> working on or a petition, basically. So they're going to go. Thanks. Don't bother us because it's not something you're you're actually. You're not dealing with an existing law. You're dealing with fabricating a law. But, I mean, I think it's actually worth emphasizing to the housing authority that they do have this standing conflict, a potential conflict that would... would uh, it's already there. I, that's what I'm saying. Decisions could be challenged based on the potential <coughs> violations of what might be construed as a conflict of interest. I, I would be surprised if there are not opinions from the Ethics Commission about existing housing authorities. I can tell you that there are regulations about that. that kind of set the, the parameters. Um, I just wanted to address kind of the philosophical underpinnings here too because we went very quickly to talking about the conflict of all of the kind of legal um, ramific potential legal ramifications um, and it's something that we talked about at length, I'd say, in the Community Resources Committee, which is this concept of having the people who live in these communities able to um, have influence on the decisions of the Housing Authority and the importance of that and how um, a lot of the people that live in Housing Authority uh, buildings and communities are people who have uh, historically been marginalized because of disability, uh, race, uh, income status, all those things. And so this, the I think the philosophical underpinnings, the social, socio-political underpinnings here are really important in that it, 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 it's a piece of work that we would contribute to as a council in moving this forward um, that attempts to give voice to people about um, their own communities and how they want their own communities to look. And one of the things that came up, and you probably read this in the minutes, the, the draft minutes, um, is that uh, Councillor O'Donnell brought up the example of condo housing, where the tenants and the people who own condos, even if they're not on site, they're the ones most often that make up the board of a condo association, so that they, in fact, have this ability to influence decisions about the place where they actually live their lives. So this is a, a kind of an, an example of how this legislation, this uh, order, and how this change would um, affect people who live in housing authority communities. And there are tenants here today again, so I'll stop hogging them. <laughs> Do have you guys want to speak to this? Yeah, I would love to. Sure. Hello. My name is Edgardo Cancel. I am. Um, I grew up here in Northampton. I uh, currently live at Hampshire Heights. Um, I grew up in Florence Heights, um, mid to late 80s, um, and um, 
Uh, I've been uh, very connected with both of these uh, communities, Florence Heights and Hampshire Heights, uh, over the last 31 years. Um, once uh, we moved out, uh, well, let me just first of all start by saying that, in my opinion, uh, public housing is sort of a, a stepping stone to the next uh, level. Is uh, is where you uh, 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 are sort of in transition. For in, in my opinion, the way I look at public housing, because it was my experience growing up and the way that my parents did it is um, that um, you're not necessarily thinking that you're gonna stay there the rest of your life, but rather something uh, uh, that will get you by until you uh, get yourself and family into a position to be able to buy a home or move on to the next thing. Um, my parents were a perfect example of that. We came here, my dad and my mom uh, both had a eighth, in, eighth grade and ninth grade um, education respectively and they came here, uh, learned the language, went to school, learned the language, um, uh, uh, went, uh, uh, graduated from that, went to Holy Community College, got their associate's degree, all while living in public housing, um, and then later on ended up getting the uh, necessary training to become a, a school bus driver and a cafeteria person. Um, not, uh, not long after that, they were able to purchase their first home. Um, and so my parents have lived the American dream, um, but it was thanks to that step in <coughs> um, uh, when we lived in Florence Heights and the type of resources um, that were available uh, to families then. Um, and also the type of collaboration between the housing authority and the uh, existing tenant associations at the time. At the time we had a lot more um, I don't think that there are many tenant associations now um, that are working with the housing authority. And I have a lot to say about that, but I don't want to uh, sort of uh, go off track uh, with that. The fact of the matter is that we don't have good working uh, tenant associations. And um, part of the reason is uh, the resistance from the housing authority uh, to have those tenant associations be uh, collaborative and be working um, on behalf of the residents. Um, having said that, um, I also uh, believe that, well, let me just back up to um, what I was going to say earlier. Over the, since we moved out of Florence Heights, I, I continue to do community work uh, at both Florence Heights and Hampshire Heights. Uh, in 1997, I received a grant uh, by Cooley Dickinson Hospital to do a summer program at Florence Heights. I uh, was very successful. Um, at the end of the summer, I was able to uh, report back to the Healthy Communities Committee at part of the um, uh, Cooley Dickinson Hospital. Um, they were so impressed uh, with the work that was done there that they actually asked me to become part of the um, uh, committee. And I served that committee for five years. Over uh, the last 20, 25 years, I've served on many boards, including Valley CDC back in the early 90s. We were responsible for uh, uh, re, uh, remodeling this building right back here with all the back when the staircases were sort of falling. Um, I was a vice president of the uh, Valley CDC at the time. Um, I've also served on many boards. Um, currently I serve on the Housing Partnership Committee um, and I've uh, participated in a lot of uh, these boards and in my experience they're usually bigger boards um, in in my opinion, in an uh, organization with a size like this, I think having only five members is um, sort of inefficient. So on that aspect, I really think this is a good idea. Um, the other reason why I think it's a good idea is because um, uh, having residents, more residents be part of a, uh, the board of an organization um, uh, speaks to uh, what the counselor was talking about earlier. Uh, uh, residents being able to make decisions on what's going to affect um, uh, the uh, livelihood and uh, uh, their families. Um, and I actually see absolutely no conflict of interest um, when it comes to that because that's the whole point. It's for people to be able to make decisions um, about um, how things are going to be uh, operating and how, how they're going to affect them in my uh, I, I couldn't think of a way in which any particular uh, member would benefit directly financially because decisions that are made 
uh, at that level, and I go to all of their board meetings every month. I'm very involved um, uh, with um, uh, public housing in the last 10, 15 years. Um, so I know that um, I, I've never seen a decision where I, can, I see that somebody uh, individually uh, um, uh, gained any sort of financial um, uh, gain uh, from decisions that were made at the board. Uh, in fact, that's the whole point. Uh, usually, uh, the way that most housing authorities operate is um, they have 10 associations and then the housing authority meets with those associations uh, every three months quarterly. Um, by the way, that hasn't happened in years uh, here in Northampton. Um, and uh, they discuss, the tenant association and the board uh, or uh, the housing authority discuss plans, uh, how, um, how the uh, funds coming from state or federal funds are gonna be spent, capital plan, capital improvement plan, all of those types of things get actually um, uh, negotiated between the tenant associations and the housing authority. Um, so uh, all of these decisions um, affect uh, the residents. And um, in the recent past, um, there has been a lot of issues. Um, I know the air conditioner one uh, was one that was very public, but there are a lot of many other issues that um, have not been made public um, that are currently um, uh, uh, um, problems. Uh, with the current structure at, at this uh, uh, local housing authority. Um, and so uh, part of the reason why I'm here is because I totally support um, uh, this order. And I know it um, it's, hasn't been done around the state in this way, um, but one of my points that I made last week at, uh, at the meeting was that we're, um, we're an amazing city and we are trendsetters. We have done things in the past um, that no other uh, uh, city uh, has done and we have been able to put uh, legislation forward uh, and make changes that really uh, improve uh, uh, the lives of residents, of our local residents. So um, uh, as difficult as uh, it may seem, I think it's a great um, uh, thing for us to have, be having these discussions um, and to at least uh, consider um, them um, and uh, and then you know leave it up to the state uh, to see whether you know um, uh, they they agree with it or not. Um, but I know from my personal experience in doing the work that I've been doing here, I've also done many cleanups at both of the uh, um, uh, properties, and I uh, currently serve on the board of the tenant association uh, at Hampshire Heights. Um, I know that um, this would be a huge step in the right direction in terms of. Uh, being able to uh, solve a lot of problems that are currently uh, happening. If you talk to, um, and I plan on bringing more residents if, if we have another uh, public discussion about it. Um, this was kind of last minute, um, and I did invite some folks, but they weren't able to come. Um, but I think it would be a great opportunity for people to come and talk about why they favor this idea. Everyone I've spoken to at both properties, Florence Heights and Hampshire Heights, um, and uh, I always speak about Florence Heights and Hampshire Heights, but I'm also connected uh, to the uh, senior, uh, where a lot of our elders live. Um, I used to run a social, a Latino social club at Salvo House on Tuesday nights through Casa Latina, and both my parents and my grandmother used to live there. Uh, so I have a lot of experience also with um, what our elders uh, face uh, in our public housing community, but. Um, I, I don't want to take any more of your time. I really appreciate you folks um, even considering having this conversation. And again, I just, I'm, I'm in favor of this. Thank you. Yeah. Um, hey, Mr. Burton. Come on up. Thanks, Tom. <coughs> I'm Tom Burton, uh, Salvo House, Down the Street. Down the street. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I just very briefly just want to I, would, I really like the idea that Brian has, Brian has uh, introduced this. It's uh, the the air conditioning issue was simply the, the last of the of many you know issues that have come up over the last five years that I've lived there. But probably the most serious because it involved people's lives uh, and threatened people's lives. And you know the, the director isn't different to this until she's called until there's something in the newspaper about it. She doesn't respond. 
So there's a necessity for the people in the community to be directly able to, to write her on her because, you know, we had nothing to say in how she was picked. She was, or we did, but then she was chosen by you guys and the mayor, not by, you know, we, we had nothing to say about it. And uh, the consequences of that have been a long train of, of you know, diktats from people, from someone and from the board who rubber stamps a lot of the stuff that she does. So it's important that we have uh, tenants on this board and that people have an actual control over their lives. That's basically the, the crux of all of this. Um, I, mean, I don't know what the next issue will be, but there will be another issue. Whether it'll be as serious as this one or, I don't know. Kind of on a six month schedule over there, the next thing will pop up and you know, oh my God, are they serious? In fact, they are. Anyway, that's my bit about that. And I really hope you guys will approve of this, send it out to the other committee and send it out to the council. And, you know, maybe with, uh, with Joe Cumberford and Lindsay, maybe we can get this also adjusted in the, in, in the legislature and do something. And I realize it's kind of a long road, but a, ne a necessary one. A necessary one because the summer it actually involved it, whether or not people could die. So it was that serious. And that's not hyperbole, that was really true. Um, anyway, thank you. So, Tom, just for the record, yes. um, we are not the appointing authority. Oh, I know that, but you guys, you, but you guys, but the, the council rubber stamps to the, 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 um, when they, the, the people that are on the board and then the, the, we, we do approve the board members. We don't approve. We have no direct. say on the director, the choice of director or hiring the director at all. Right. Neither does the mayor for that matter. Okay, I take it back. Okay. <laughs> just, but I just want but that clear. If you guys do, I mean, but, you know, it's, it's like, and then there's a, there's a chain, and there's a, then, then there's a chain of, of, of consequences because it's, wasn't my, exactly my job to fix that. It wasn't exactly. So, and it gets removed a number of times. I mean, it wasn't exactly the mayor's job either. Uh, but yeah. it's the it's one of those deals where we don't have authority, we have influence. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah. the influence the influence is not to be underestimated. The influence, oh, no. the, influence of the newspaper is what what actually stops her in the tracks. Because right. uh, so it's the influence, the bully pulpit of the. I would hope that the mayor generally responded with boilerplate at first. So, um, but if people use their moral authority as, as um, representatives of the community, it does have an impact. It does have an impact on her. It does have an impact on them. Um, they were blindsided by this, I said. They had no, at the meeting that they had after this first broke, regarding the air conditioning issue, there was no, uh, there was no, they said, well, she said, well, I didn't have to tell you guys that. That's, I could make that decision. And she pulled out her rule book. So, was, you know, if the, the, uh, the board members have one, then they, the HUD Act prints a you know, rule book for the directors, too. So there was that. And they said, yes, we do. And I said, no, we don't. So that was, you know, she kind of left it with that. But still, you know, as these things get removed, that's why it's important to have the people who actually live in the community having a say. And that's not a conflict of interest. That's a direct interest, it, you know, and it, as far as financial things go. I mean, the amount of money that we pay as tenants, which is the biggest basic financial, is it's, that's set up as a formula. So we don't have a, nobody, whether you're a tenant, uh, has a say about it. There's, there's a formula that you use based upon your income. So it's not something which is, is uh, simply a, the result of, of uh, you know, that you can manipulate. I can't I lower my rent if I got this, this, this curve. That, that can't happen. That wouldn't happen. So it's a bit of a canard to say that there's a conflict of interest. I think it's not really, yeah. not really, not not something that's practical on a, on a you know on a working basis with that. But anyway, thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Uh, the proposal, that right? So so where where we sit now is that uh, actually we're we're going to continue this. Um, it seems that there's going to be ample opportunities. I've got to to have people come and talk about this. And Tom, that we could, uh, at the very least, the very least, community resources can have another meeting on it. We're going to have another meeting on it. Then there's two meetings in the council. Um, that's if everything goes as normal. And it sounds like this may this may morph as it goes. So, so that it seems to me there will be opportunity. Councilor Donald, you had something you want to say? That? No, not really. I just thought you might have other questions. But I appreciate your consideration. I mean. I do. I do acknowledge it's an experiment. Oh, I, you know. I mean, 
But, you know, it's, I, I'll tell you, I mean, ever, just today, this is a true story, which you know, because the story is not very entertaining, but I was in Florence downtown, just running an errand, and a woman came up to me who lives in public housing, and I, turns out I had talked to her on the phone before, and she was catching me up on the issues she brought up, and all of us get uh, uh, calls from people all the time in public housing, and it's really difficult because, as, as multiple people have said, these institutions really are sort of like legal islands, and we need to build a bridge to those islands so that there could be greater accountability. Um, because oftentimes, while well, we can call up the housing authority and urge action, we, as, as um, the, the chair has said, uh, we have no formal authority over what goes on. But I like the idea of Northampton leading the way, as Mr. Consell said, um, in, uh, with an innovative proposal, which might be hard to do. But I think there's a lot of opportunity to discuss this, because the people who live in public housing are citizens of the city of Northampton, just like everyone else. And they are often invisible. They often are voiceless, but they deserve some influence over the policies that affect their lives. So I really appreciate the consideration of the committee today. It's, it's been <clears throat> my ongoing belief, and in fact, actually aptly described uh, by people speaking testifying today, that there's actually a de facto disenfranchisement of people who live within the communities that are, are uh, subsidized housing. And you should not sacrifice your, your your ability to appeal to an authority that will render a decision that would be, that would hopefully benefit you. And this has been our frustration, actually. You know, as you think about how votes break down, um, a lot of people in Florence Heights, Hampshire Heights, and Meadowbrook don't vote particularly because there is no manifestation of any effect of their vote on their by their representatives. They, they, I've. Um, I used to represent Hampshire Heights, and the frustration there expressed continually was that the removal that you described, and the frustration and the impotency of trying to explain, all I can do is make a call. I have no authority. I can't tell anyone what to do. I can't, I can't even make a law or an ordinance changing anything like this. Um, so. It seems to me, and I think the, the parallel with condo associations is apt. I think that's very appropriate. But so I'm, I'm looking forward to the conversations, and, and, and they will continue. It seems. Councilor, I would uh, make that motion. We continue this until community resources is finished. Um, just before, I, I mean, I I was hoping that we could make use of the time with um, Alan Council. here just to. Clear up any other. Have you any other yeah. Questions? So, for example, um, uh, and I guess I, you know, I didn't get a chance to review all of the minutes, but I think that this probably came up in the community resources. Um, so, I, I think that there was a change from um, instruct the mayor or to that it was changed to yes, request. It was directed to request it. If oh, instead of directed, and that's because you can't direct we can't direct. Anything. Okay, <laughs> so so ultimately, the wording is that the the order would be that we request authorized and requested. Authorized. Because the mayor can't do this without your authorization. That's actually what you're giving the mayor is authorization to seek seek special legislation. That's right. how it reads now. Right. Okay. That's that's how it reads now. Okay. That's an order that the mayor is authorized and requested to seek state. Oh, okay. Uh, is the mayor's authorized and requested to seek state legislation? Okay. So, um, and was it so? What if the mayor does not? You know, I mean, we can make that request, but this goes nowhere if the mayor chooses not to move forward. That's true. Okay, so so really all we can do is, is um, so that's why I'm curious why it's called an order. It's just, because an order sounds like we're ordering, you know. And he has to comply. So. Yeah, that's what I asked. But, there, but there's no, well, what there's else no would you requirement call? for, there's no requirement for compliance. No, it could be a resolution. Even that, then, that, 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 that would pass muster at the legislature because it's not enforceable. 
the re resolution is just a statement of your current view on a matter. We, uh, so uh, actually, theoretically, if the mayor were to do this on his own, he wouldn't even need him. He wouldn't need a council yeah. order. Yeah. Needs a council order. Oh, okay. He needs to be right. authorized by the right. council. Exactly. Okay. Okay. We can authorize him, but we can't make him. <laughs> same, thing with, same thing, for instance, with appropriations. You can appropriate money, you can't make them spend it. So my understanding, right. to follow up on what Maureen was asking, is that this is standard language for all Absolutely. Just okay. that's language. important to know. Okay, those were some of the things I was, I was hoping to get some clarity about. Um, Any other yeah, questions? I had a really quick follow-up. Um, before Council Murphy even mentioned this concept of doing a, a resolution and that not having the authority to authorize the mayor and it wouldn't, it wouldn't be tantamount to a home rule petition is um, directed towards you, Councilor Donald, would it be useful? Is this enough of a statement that this is the will of the city council if it should pass and we authorize the mayor to speak to the legislature um, that we also Accompany it with a resolution that gets more specific in terms of why this is an, uh, a, a goal or aspiration of the council of Northampton? Hmm. It's an interesting concept. I hadn't thought about it in those terms. I view the order as sort of a vehicle that could be useful for a more expansive discussion. Um, so to me, the order was an appropriate enough vehicle and just then in our conversations about it, although they wouldn't uh, be written down anywhere, I think we would elucidate some of the issues as we, as we have today. Um, so that's my thought right off the bat. That I, I would stick with the order rather than double it up with the resolution, although I'm always open if counselors want to draft one or touch on related issues. But, you know, I mean, that was my answer. Um, is there a second on the continuance? Uh, yes. Okay. All those in favor of continuing to our next meeting, please say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Right, but, uh, I guess um, I'm wondering whether we need, I mean, our practice, our standard for our practice has been to always wait until this goes through. So maybe instead of saying until our next meeting, until, until it comes oh. out of all of the. Uh, that was. That's the, motion. Yeah. The second. that's the motion. I'll continue oh, to okay. that. Okay. The, motion. Yeah. the community resources has okay. forwarded their recommendation. Right, because, because community resources may hold a couple of yeah. forums. forums, and right. there may be other things that come out of that. I mean, it could be months. Okay, so the, I'll reiterate the continuance till we receive the recommendation from community resources. That was a motion. And we did acknowledge in that community resources meeting that we have a 60 day window, I think, with, within which we have, was it 60 days? within which we have to complete the, um, the two community right. fora and the follow-up meeting of the Community Resources Committee. What, yeah. and and then, but that's a rule can be amended, right? You could ask for more time, right? Yeah. Okay. yeah. But the goal of the Community Resources Committee was to get the fora done yeah. before that period of time and have a second meeting. Okay. If you work backwards and want to finish it roughly by the end of the year, just for practical purposes, because hopefully we'll have a state delegation not long after that. Um, so if the if the months of October and November can be used for discussion and the council can vote in December or consider voting in December, that would be a reasonable time. And I think the rules say you community resources has 60 days, whereupon legislative matters then has an additional 30. So it sounds like ample time, yeah. That would bring us right up to the December, kind of when we're hopefully yep. going to have state delegation. You could act earlier, too. OK, so on the floor is the continuance. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. All right. All right. Now, as I said, the first two items, which is now we bump up to the top of the agenda, items one, two, three, and one, two, five, uh, we're going to have to wait until they come from TPC. So that brings us to item item eighteen point one three seven. This is an ordinance relative to parking on King Street. Um, this came with a positive recommendation for transportation and parking. Thank you guys. Thank you very much. Um, 
I accept the motion. Put this on the floor. Discussion? Councilor Nash, is there anything new that's come up since we, the first six times we've discussed this? This is the OK 115 minute spot in front of a Sutter. Leave your phone on tomorrow. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks for coming. And he got a positive recommendation from TPC. forward with a positive recommendation please say aye aye any opposed any abstentions okay thank you all right um mastering my computer next up is um we did a dare place we did democratic representation this is we did cemeteries this is okay item 152 um this is an ordinance to amend chapter nine of the court of ordinances by adding Section 9-1 and subsection 9-2. This is referred to the council, uh, referred by the council in August. Uh, okay. And um, is there a motion to put this on the floor? This is. Um, Essentially, subsection, proposed subsection 9 1 is that special committees establish and conduct a review of the city charter be conducted at 10 year intervals in the years ending in A9 in accordance with uh, section 10 6 of the city charter. And subsection uh, 9 2 is membership um, and the term. The special committee shall be comprised of nine members who shall be appointed for a term commencing. No earlier than January 1 and no later than July 1 in a year ending in a 9. And one member shall be a member of the City Council appointed by the City Council President. And one member shall be an employee of the Executive Branch of the City appointed by the Mayor. Seven members shall be citizens of the City, one from each ward appointed by the Mayor, with confirmation of the City Council in accordance with Section 2-10 of the City Charter. All members uh, of the Special Committee shall be registered voters in the City. The special committee shall be under the supervision of the city solicitor. And the special committee shall convene no later than 30 days after its appointment, hold meetings as necessary, and follow the city clerk no later than December 31st of the year ending in a nine, and report summarizing the special committee's recommendations with any proposed revisions of the city charter contained therein. And the special committee shall dissolve upon the submission of its report to the city clerk. Um, Want to speak to briefly? The yes, <clears throat> um, you know, I work with the mayor on putting this together. It, it's in format very much like the ordinance review committee, and there was the retirement or the compensation review committee. I can't remember which one it was. Also Correct. organized this way. Um, uh, I, I can report to you that the the current mayor's intention is to ask each ward councilor to make a recommendation of someone from their ward just as he's done in the past in other situations and so that's that's what he intends to do here um this seemed like a, a reasonable way to proceed i could answer any questions uh, and i would also ask you all if you have any if you've made any notes in your home version of the charter about things that that are problematic to you i would love to hear them. uh any questions yep we, we uh, Councilor Dow. Oh, um, does the ordinance say that a, a ward councilor will suggest? No. Okay. It could. It could. Okay. Yep, it could if you want. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we, we've come up against it. We're up to it. It's hard to believe, actually. But yeah. the fact is, it's time for charter review, and certainly we've flagged few things more than a few things so um, and hopefully by the end of the year ending in nine we'll actually have representation um, should should any of the discrepancies come up that we want to petition again the legislature for the opportunity to change those portions of the charter that look like they need changing 
Um, I would suggest that if uh, I have uh, don't I haven't heard any uh, proposals for amendment. It can certainly be amended on the floor if anyone's inclined that way. All right. Any other discussion? Okay. All those uh, in favor of moving forward with a favorable recommendation, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. <clears throat> I believe. <laughs> I would first move we approve our minutes. Which we oh, thank done. you very much. Wow. Yes, that's right. We skipped right over there. Thank thank you. You. Right the Good catch. Yes. So there's a motion to approve the minutes. Second. And a second. That's in the minutes of uh, July 9th. Uh, all those in favor of approving the minutes, please say aye. Aye. And then no. we have one other item, and that's to deal with the uh, the dates, the possible conflict of hmm, October and November. Perfect. Right. 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 This is, so, as you know, thank you, Alan. Um, we have two potential conflicts on holidays that the problem, of course, have meetings on Mondays. It's all federal holidays that fall on those now, so. Um, how's everyone's calendar look? Hold on a sec. Uh, Hold on. October, that must be October 8th. Yeah, that's something. Yeah. Um, we do the 9th, Tuesday? Um, to do it on that Tuesday. Theoretically is okay with me. The ninth? The ninth would be okay. Five o'clock. The TPC is the third Tuesday? Or is it the second? Yeah, it I thought it was the fourth. It's the third Tuesday. Oh, you moved it to the third. Okay. So that doesn't conflict at least with that. Not that I care. October 9th, okay, and uh, we'll try and find a venue. Um, and then for November. And then we have our November 12th. No, um, oh, I see, because it's the second. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. Okay. So it's whether, would we do similarly try to meet on the 13th? Yeah, it'll be after the election, obviously, so. Um, <laughs> Council Murphy, how's that look for you? Looks fine for me. So Tuesday the thirteenth. Yeah. Add one day to each one, and we're good. Yeah. All right. That's certainly the easiest. Okay. Change five p.m. Council chambers. Yeah. If 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 at all possible, that'd be great. And if not, then certainly the the hearing room would be fine. So. Well, no, it's. Veterans Day is on the 11th. Yeah, it's on the 11th. So, so. we're talking about, well, first of all, I'll get this. So, October 9th instead of October 8th. Done. And November 13th instead of uh, the 12th. Yeah. All right, so there is still is that motion to adjourn. Is there a second? <laughs> you bet. Well, I think you made it. <laughs> no, I didn't. Did you make the motion? No. Oh, you did? Okay. Noted. Okay. All those in favor of turning to say aye. Aye. Thank you.